Christ is coming. All right? Christ is coming. Today we're going to look at the first part, which is the preparation part. You see, for any kind of an event, there has to be a preparation happening. If there were no preparation, the, you can just imagine that event would not be great. Am I right? There has to be a lot of preparation happening. And if there were no preparation at all, that event would never be great. So we look at the preparation, and then we look at the opposition, which is the second part. The opposition, and we look at the redemption, which is the third part of our discussion or talk. And so today we look at the preparation, first part of our three-part series on Christmas you know, talk for 2021. Now this Christmas series is based on Galatians chapter 4. Verse 4, which we've just read. But I'll read it out again for all of us. I'm going to read for you from the New King James Version. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So, this is really the Christmas message. All right? This is really the Christmas message. Now we're talking today about the preparation for Christmas. How did God prepare Christmas? God prepared Christmas, this might surprise you, right from the book of Genesis. Where is Genesis? The first book of the Bible, the first place where you find God creating everything else that you see around you. You see, God prepared Christmas right from Genesis until the time had fully come where Jesus was sent, where Christ was sent, where His Son was sent into this world. Now, I want to look at three parts this morning. The first is we look at the promise. What did God promise when it comes to Christmas? Secondly, we're going to look at the prophecy. So how did God use men and women to prophesy ahead of time before the real event took place, the event of Christmas? And then we will look at the plan, how God uses a very simple plan, yet very effective plan, to bring about Christ. Because the Bible says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. God sent Christ into this world. We look at the promise. If you look at Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. I know many of you are familiar with this verse. It says like this. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head. And you shall bruise his heel. Look at that. You see a promise of a savior right there in that verse. He says I will put enmity between you and the woman. Speaking to the devil here. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now he says this because he wanted to make sure that despite of what had happened, I will promise you today that when the offspring of this particular woman, whose name was Eve, her children, her offspring, particularly talking about the Savior, Lord Jesus Christ himself, that when he comes, he is going to crush your head. That was a promise God made. And so the preparation of Christmas really began from Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. That's the promise that God made to, 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 to Eve as well as to the devil talking to him particularly at the time. You see, God prepared Christmas right from the book of Genesis. Christmas did not just happen in the first, you know, first four or five books of the, of, of the New Testament. If you think about Christmas today, I would encourage you to think about the promise that God made right from the Garden of Eden, of how that he would send a son to come and to destroy the work of the enemy. Secondly, you look at the prophecy. Now, God has spoken to so many prophets, you know, uh, in the Old Testament. But particularly, if you look at the prophecy that King Nebuchadnezzar, the, the, the then king of, of Babylon, which is now Iraq, if you look at the, at the prophet, rather the dream that he had, and that Daniel being a captive slave who was brought over by the, you know, by, 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 the, by being conquered by this particular king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, brought the wise people into his kingdom so that they can serve him. And after having had this dream, 
He had called all of the Chaldeans, which means the wise people of his kingdom, asked ask them to come and interpret, or rather to tell him. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar was a very wise king then. He didn't just tell his dream to these wise men and ask them to interpret because he knew if he would have done that, they would have brought so many kinds of interpretation. But he said to them, he said, you tell the dream that I saw last night and you interpret the dream. That's a very hard task, isn't it? To tell the dream a person had and also to interpret it. And so none of them could do that. They insisted the king, they said, well, please tell us the dream, we will interpret for you. But he said, no. If you, are, if you cannot tell the dream I had last night, then you're not a wise man or you're not a wise community in my kingdom. And so he destroyed all of them. Somebody reported about Daniel, a captive slave who had been brought over from, from, from Judah into this great nation of, of, of Babylon. Daniel came before the king and he tells him exactly what Nebuchadnezzar had saw in his dream. And not just that, he interpreted the dream. Now this become as a prophecy which laid the foundation for what is to come. And today we look at the prophecy of Nebuchadnezzar. Sorry, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and the interpretation of this very dream as the most important, important outline of the, of the, of the, of the church and its journey. Because if you look at this particular dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and how did God reveal to this pagan king, a king who had never worshipped Jehovah, Jehovah the God of Israel. And how did God use Daniel, a Jewish person, an Israelite, to come about here and interpret this dream and bring about this outline of the entire journey of the church. Thankfully, all of these prophecies that were made during that time had come to pass already. Now, what did King Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream? He saw this huge, gigantic person, uh, a sort of an image at the top of his, of his physical, let's say at the, the head part, it was made of gold, okay? And his chest part was constructed with silver. And, his, and then, and then his, uh, his ties, uh, of course, uh, were, um, uh, yeah, his ties were of, were of uh, uh, bronze, right? And then his down part were of iron, steel. Now, when he saw this, Daniel interpreted this dream to say that this upper part, which is the head part, which is, which is made of gold, represents the present kingdom, which is the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom, the great kingdom then, ruled by Nebuchadnezzar. And that how that his kingdom will be destroyed. Because after him, there will come another kingdom, which is more stronger which is the kingdom of the Persians. And that represents the chest part, which is the silver part. And after that, this kingdom also will fall. And after this kingdom will fall, another kingdom will come, which will be the kingdom of the Greeks. The kingdom of the Greeks. And that is the bronze part. And so each of these kingdoms have a role to play. And after that, what happens is after the Greeks have gone, you will have the Romans who come and rule the entire earth. And so all of these prophecy that, that, that uh, Daniel uh, you know, interpreted in a way had come to pass. Because in this prophecy he sees that there is another thing that took place which is, a, we call it a rock or a huge stone, so to say, which is uncarved by any human hands that came and destroyed this entire image. And Daniel, purpose, prof, uh, Daniel interpreted this as the kingdom of God that, will, that is to come and to destroy all of the other kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. And when this kingdom come, it will destroy everything in it. And that's the prophecy that was made about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that came true through the birth of Jesus on this earth. And so if you look at the prophecy, if you look at this interpretation of this dream rather, you realize this, that the coming of the, of, the, of, the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, or Christmas really, is right there in the prophecy that was made. The interpretation that Daniel made in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar. So you see, the Christmas, you know, the Christmas story is really not something that you look at only at the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. But you look at it right from the Old Testament. 
in the prophecy, it was there. And so, and so, and so Daniel really brought about this interpretation of the dream to make us realize today that yes, Christ has been prophesied even through that very, very significant dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And so it came into reality when Jesus came. You see, when Jesus came, he came to preach the kingdom. You see that? So when Jesus came, he came and he brought about a kingdom, which is the kingdom of God. And so the, the promise is that God have promised the, the, the coming of Christ right from Genesis. The prophecy we look at is from Daniel it's him, and the interpretation of, his, of, of the dreams of, of Nebuchadnezzar there. And then we come to the plan. How did God really plan the coming of his son? We're looking at a preparation here. How did God really plan? There are three significant people's group that we need to look at when we talk about how God really planned. He works through these three people's group. God called Abraham first. And he says, Abraham, I call you into a nation. I call you to be a father of many nations. And I call you into a country. You know, and I call you into a place where, where, where you're going to enjoy life, really. But all throughout this journey, God has always been dealing with Abraham. And after that, a nation was born. Jacob came in the scene. His name was changed into Israel. And the nation of Israel was born. And how that they were taken into slavery and all of that. All because they have disobeyed God's commandment. Because God has chosen this nation. It is God's will and God's way of how and why he chose the Jewish people to be a person who would represent, to be a people's group or a nation to represent God on this earth. But despite of having this very special calling from God, they displeased God all the time. They disobeyed him all the time and God had to punish them. And that's why they had to be in slavery for 400 years, be under the rule of the Egyptians and so on. Not until the time when God chose Moses and brought him, you know, brought, uh, called him to, to release his people and so on. You see, God have chosen the nation of Israel. There's one thing about the nation of Israel, and that's this. The nation of Israel, although they disobeyed God, yet there's always a cluster of people. And we call them the remnants. There's always a group of people among the Jewish people who chose to follow God wholeheartedly. Like that of Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. The Jewish people have always been religious people. The Jewish people have always been religious people. Excluding the ones that does not really count their faith seriously. The Jewish people will die for their faith. They will die for their faith. And there are two particular groups of, of, of religious groups that grew uh, even before, you know, 400, 500 years before Christ came, before the Christmas really happens. And those were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And you find that in the, in the New Testament everywhere you read them. Somebody said the, the Sadducees are the people who are sad. They call them as the sad you see. And the Pharisees are the people who are always far and you see them as the far you see people. They are far away from God. And the Sadducees are always serious. They are always sad all the time. You look at them. And so the Sadducees are the ones who are in control of the, of the religious acts. And they were the ones who are in control of the, of the, of the, of the what we call the, the court. The court, the Jewish court. We call them the, the Sanhedrin. Okay? And in the Sanhedrin, you see amongst the, 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 the board of, of, of justice, if I may call it, there is a high priest. Now what does it say? It tells that the Jewish people does not really believe only in, you know, big-headed people. They believe in the religious people. And that's why they have the high priest in the board of justice, in the Sanhedrin. Think about that. The Jewish people are a very religious people because God have imprinted himself into Abraham and the, and the, and the generations to come. You see, the Jewish people are the most religious people. And God used these people to talk about Jehovah everywhere. Today, we are, you know, our faith is based on the Jewish faith, whether you like it or not. But they stop somewhere and we've moved further on by believing Christ as the Messiah. And they don't believe Christ as the Messiah. And so we've moved ahead. But here, if you look at the Jewish faith, it's the foundation of our faith today. If there were no Jew Jewish faith, if there were no Abraham, we wouldn't have our faith today. And so the Jewish people have given to us faith. And God used this group of people to prepare for Christmas, to prepare for the coming of Christmas. Secondly, God used the Greeks. You see, when the kingdom of Greece came, 
after the Persians. You know, uh, 300 or uh, 300, uh, over 300 years, I, I, I think, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm correct, over 300 years before Christ was born, there was this great man called Alexander the Great. If you remember him, if you, you may have read him in history. Now, this, this great king, he was known as Alexander the Great because he did some great things. He went all over the place and conquered people and conquered nations and conquered tribes. And what does he do? You know what? He enforced the Greece culture. Wherever he goes, he wants the people to speak Greek. And the, the Greek language was, was far spread in, in, in a way because of forced, you know, forced implementation of the language. So if they go conquer a nation, they win over that, they let the people speak Greeks. And so they would do that. And like Alexander the Great almost conquered the entire world, almost conquered. <laughs> He'd move around, conquered nations after nations, and enforced the Greek culture. Now this is how God prepared Christmas. Because when Jesus came, the Greek culture had spread all over Asia Minor and beyond. The Greek culture has spread so much, we call it Hellenistic culture or the Greek culture. And we, there's a term we use that, we use there, we call it the Hellenization or the, you know, the, 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 the forceful use of the Greek culture into other culture. And so God was preparing Christmas even through the Greeks because when Jesus came, most of the people speak Greeks. And if you don't know this, the New Testament, the New Testament was written in Greek. God was uniting the people in terms of language because he was preparing for his son to come. If people would have spoken in different, different languages, then the coming of the gospel will not be as impactful. But God used, because the prophecy we see in Daniel there came to fulfillment because when the Greek came, overtook the Persians and the other kingdoms, they enforced the language, enforced the culture and prepare for Jesus to come. So when Jesus comes, there would be one language that was spoken around. Most common language in those days was the Greek and the Aramaic. It was believed that Jesus spoke Aramaic, of course, but the Greek language was very influential. And so God prepared Christmas by uniting the language. And that's why you have the New Testament written in Greek. Now, the third category of people that God used, the third category of people that God used to prepare Christmas were the Romans. The Romans came, they were not interested with the language. They allowed the Greeks to keep on going on with their culture and all of that. But the Romans were interested with other things. They were interested in capturing nations and connecting nations and building military powers. And so God prepared the Romans. The Romans came, they built roads everywhere. And that's why we have a saying which says, every road leads to Rome. You go anywhere, it leads to Rome. Because they build roads everywhere, they build bridges everywhere. That's what the Romans did. And not just that, they established governors. They established, you know, uh, uh, what we call military rules everywhere. So they are more into power. They are more into, into, into name, into fame, into power, into conquering and all of that. But more importantly, the Romans were more into order. So we're looking at preparation today. We say, God, you promised it. And you brought it into fulfillment. You prophesied it. That this and this kingdom will come. And ultimately the kingdom of, of God will come in. And all of this have happened. And then we look at the, the plan of how you did that. God, you didn't just stay silent. You have a plan of how you want to come send your son and rescue us. These are all logical things we look at. I just want to leave this question with us today. How are we preparing for Christmas this year? How are we preparing for Christmas? God never just do things. Amen. Even if you look at the Christmas this year, I believe God prepares it. He had already prepared it from the first day of January this year. As to how your Christmas will look like this year. You see, God still prepares Christmas today, as I said. He still prepares Christmas today. Except that his preparation style has changed. God is still preparing. Except that his plan has changed. Now, how does God prepare? Over, over 2,000 years ago, God prepared Christmas. As is what we've learned. The promise, the prophecy, and his plan. Using those three major uh, people's group, the Jews, the Greeks, and Romans. Today God prepares Christmas, I believe. I believe. Truly, from my heart, he prepares Christmas in a personal way. 
a very personal way. Amen? I want you to get this today. That God prepares Christmas for this year in a very personal way. He won't use the Greeks, nor the Jews, nor the Romans. He won't use any one of them. He will use you to prepare you for his coming. And I just want to leave you with this question. Will you be willing to say yes to this Christ that is coming? Will you be willing to say yes to him? Yes to him. So I want us to be prepared for Christ this time. Be prepared for his coming. And when we celebrate uh, you know, Christmas on the 25th, that we should understand the, 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 the full plan of God for, for my life, for our life. So why he has really come and how that it impacted my life and how that my life can impact others. Now that I can make a change in this world. So let us be those people. But it all begins from this very Christmas of preparing our hearts to say yes to this coming Christ. Amen.